I will present the research we are doing at City University of New York with my colleague Taylor. Uh, we are trying to get information in real time from Twitter or what is happening on Twitter to update Wikipedia with fresh information. Uh, so the title of our talk is, hey, it's trending, let's update that Wikipedia article. The, well, the presentation has mainly two parts, uh, as the whole pipeline of the system also has two parts. The first part is we look into Twitter, we are looking specifically on Twitter's trending topics, and from that we find news that of what is happening right now, or fresh news. And the second part, taking this news as an, as an input, looks for fresh content in this news and up updates Wikipedia with new content. Well, for the first part, the Twitter to news, we are working, as I said, on trending topics. The trending topics are those terms or conversation that, conversations that are being discussed uh, by lots of users on Twitter in real time. So we want to know from those what is happening right now. Uh, the problem is that all those trending topics are not always related to news or something relevant that should trigger an update on Wikipedia. And that's what we want to see, which of the trending topics are really have an impact on Wikipedia and should be updated. This is an example of a list of trending topics that Twitter shows in some given moment. And well, the goal would be to check which of those are actually newsworthy and should trigger some update on Wikipedia to create a new. We have done some research on this using some 2,500 trending topics that we got from Twitter. And well, we saw that a few of them are newsworthy, so most of them are usually memes or some funny ideas that users are sharing. And so it's not relevant for Wikipedia, like all this Justin Bieber stuff. And well, to analyze this automatically to, to find out which of the trending topics are actually newsworthy, we are using some social features like retweets, replies, and this kind of stuff that help us determine whether or not a trending topic is newsworthy. And right now using this system with a classifier that makes use of these features, we have some quite good accuracy, almost 80% of the trending topics we report are actually newsworthy and we are able to find 60% of the news that are actually happening and trending on Twitter. So we will work on improving this, but I think it's quite a good part. And well, finishing this first part, for each trending topic, we are able to provide whether or not it is it is newsworthy. So we will only output those those that are actually newsworthy. And for those newsworthy trending topics, we will provide also a list of news articles from newspapers. So the second part can look into new information to update Wikipedia. And now Taylor will focus more specifically in the second part, which is the most relevant to Wikimania, and will show how we make use of news to update Wikipedia. Okay. Hello, I'm Taylor Cassidy. I'm a PhD student at the City University of New York, and as Arcade said, I'm going to talk about the second part of our pipeline. Uh, the main idea, uh, the inspiration, is that many citations come from news articles uh, in Wikipedia, and there's not enough human power to comb through all the news and decide uh, which things need to be updated to Wikipedia and which Wikipedia pages uh, they should be added to. Now this is easy for humans to do. Uh, we're trying to get uh, a computer to do it using natural language processing and information extraction techniques. Okay, so there's a, a task um, in NLP, natural language processing, called entity linking. And the idea is to, usually the context is a newspaper article or something like that, to given any string of text, <coughs> link it or, or say which entity it refers to in some knowledge base. So Wikipedia is a great example of such a knowledge base. Um, what we're working on here is to, once we have a newspaper article, determine which uh, Wikipedia article should be updated using entity linking. And then the idea is to find, uh, extract relevant events in that newspaper article of the sort that should be added to Wikipedia. So here I have an admittedly somewhat convoluted pipeline of how that might work. So uh, the leftmost side, you can see uh, some of the things that Arcade's mentioned. It's uh, basically just um, given tweets, we're going to look for relevant newspaper articles. 
Uh, next, we want to determine which Wikipedia pages would be updated. Um, and then the main idea behind what we want to do here is to look at what are the facts that are in the newspaper, what are the facts that are in Wikipedia, and uh, what are the facts that are such that they're only in the news and not in Wikipedia. So the idea before of event linking is uh, the following. If you can link an event in news to one that's already in Wikipedia and the appropriate page, then that shouldn't be added. Um, and if you can't, then it should be added. So uh, I'm in the process of still creating a, a data set. This is a, a work in progress. Um, but uh, I'm starting with reports of deaths um, of individuals uh, who are likely to already have a Wikipedia article. And we're only going to look for now at uh, facts directly pertaining to their death and information about their employment and titles that they might have. Okay. And uh, the task will be twofold. We'll add the, the death information and then uh, facts about employment and titles where they should go in the article. And so I'll comment later on the reasons why uh, I'm choosing this limited uh, scope. Okay. And so at the end, we'll evaluate uh, what facts were missed, what facts were correctly added, what facts shouldn't have been added, and so, so forth. So uh, here's an example of uh, somebody's Wikipedia page who recently died. Now, it doesn't indicate that he died here because this is the most recent edit before his death. Uh, it's uh, Anthony, it might, it might be hard to read, Anthony Sedlak, he was a Canadian chef and he had a show on the Food Network and uh, did some other things in his short life. So um, we want to update it with the news. So uh, here are two news articles, they're very similar, uh, that report his death. So uh, highlighted in gray, I have uh, the, the parts that pertain directly to the death. I don't know, that might be difficult to read, but it basically says that, that he died um, where he died in his apartment in North Vancouver and um, it was from an undiagnosed condition. Okay, and then we have uh, what was added to Wikipedia as a result. Uh, the article on the left I think is the one that's actually cited for this. And uh, there are a couple other things like is it changed the was and we have like maybe is, he didn't hit it as an in info box but if he did that would be changed and so forth. So what we want to find um, is redundant, first, or, or to, to find uh, redundant facts. So we're, we're going to look at all the facts we can see in the news and see which ones are redundant, which ones can we already link to somewhere on the Wikipedia page. Uh, so uh, in the blue, we have that he won something called the Super Chef Challenge. In the purple, we see that he hosted a show called The Main. And um, in the green, we see that uh, he won a silver medal uh, of, for the World Junior Chef Championship. Oh, OK, right. So um, I'm considering these titles a winner of competition, right? So uh, and then below you can see where these are in Wikipedia. So they're primarily in a section that has to do with someone's career or uh, what, what they're involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, here are three facts that are not in Wikipedia that in my somewhat naive opinion, I don't edit Wikipedia myself, could uh, be added, right? So uh, in the purple, he's the author of a cookbook. It has the same title as his show. Um, he started earlier this year a restaurant called American Cheesesteak Company. Uh, and he was a judge on the show Family Cook-Off, right? So presumably, these facts would be added somewhere under the career section. But where should they be added? This is the question. And how do we de determine this? So here are the facts and uh, some considerations for um, what we're actually adding are in what form do we uh, look at these facts? Do we look at them abstractly or as just raw text? Uh, where do we insert? How do we avoid redundancy? How do we make it uh, look more human? And how do we conform with all of the Wikipedia standards that we should be conforming with? Um, now, by the way, uh, if you're uneasy about the idea of a computer adding things to Wikipedia, you could just as easily see this as some way of aggregating information and su suggesting updates. The output could just uh, could easily be uh, the actual um, revision output that, or that, that you see when somebody makes a revision. So uh, we could add paragraphs to sections, sentences to paragraphs, or phrases to sentences. So one of the things that I want to ask the audience, people who edit Wikipedia, is what do you actually do when you see that there's some information that you want to add, maybe you want to take something from the news, how do you distill the information? Uh, if there's someone has a sentence that has some facts already in it, but you just want to edit something in that sentence, what exactly are you doing? This is what I want to look at and uh, em emulate this computationally. Um, there are already systems available that we have in our lab uh, for what's called slot filling, which is to find the uh, information that belongs in info boxes. So the slots are the uh, properties and the values are the values, right? 
And so one thing we can do is uh, we can extract these uh, facts in that way from the news. And then instead of using a sentence from the news, because and I would like to ask people, uh, there I'm sure there are issues with quoting things. We don't want it to be like a whole page of quotes. Um, we can take something like this sentence you see in the news, and in, uh, the fact that we're extracting, in this case, there are other facts, but Sedlak shot the main, which is a show, right? So we can have a template, which uh, I have a little format at the bottom of what the template might look like um, abstractly. But uh, this is OK. I mean, it, it's a little bit not so fluent. Shot, I mean, he, shot could mean a few different things. And it's not qualified enough. In context, you might know what it means. But when you look in Wikipedia, it's very nicely that they, uh, you use pronouns correctly. Um, you have a few different facts. Nothing's too redundant. Uh, so we want to get from the news and have some cross be between news and template and to get the Wikipedia uh, for, for, format. So uh, there are two main strategies that I would like to ex explore. Um, I'd like your feedback on these, if, if you have any. Uh, to, um, and is this, again, I'm trying to emulate what the human does. I imagine adding some actual news text or maybe summarizing it automatically. This is another uh, NLP task. And then post-processing, removing the redundant information, or to distill the information first, just generate very short fact-like sentences and then sort of try to work them in. Or at least, if nothing else, suggest them to somebody who regularly upkeeps that page. Um, there's some pros and cons of doing it in different ways. Basically, um, fragments of, of, of sentences, inserting those into sentences that are already there. This allows you to avoid redundancy, but the result probably won't look so great, uh, and vice versa. So there's a question of where to insert this within the Wikipedia. And I'm not really sure what the correct answer is. One thing I'm thinking, and I haven't read enough pages about people's careers to really know this, but it seems like and maybe this is the obvious choice to put everything chronologically as much as possible. Unfortunately, that's a very difficult task in natural language processing to understand the order of events. We're working on this as well, but uh, perhaps that's the, the way to go. Um, if, if there's any other, if there's any time where that shouldn't be the case, I, I would like to know. And then there's the question of, in particular, what section, well, sections sometimes have very similar related names. Um, right. So uh, here are some final thoughts. Um, right, so what I propose to, to do uh, initially is to keep building this corpus of just death articles. Obituaries are written, uh, as you know, in a very sort of encyclopedic way. Uh, ideally, in the future, we'd like to take live events as they actually happen and not just go back and find out what people have historically missed about somebody's life after they're dead. Um, also incorporate temporal information. And uh, ultimately, if something newsworthy happens, say somebody dies and they never had a Wikipedia article, maybe create an initial Wikipedia article and then people can go in and edit it. Um, and so I have a few questions for you if, uh, if you're an avid Wikipedia editor, have any ideas, um, or if you have any questions to ask us. Yes? Wait for the microphone. Oops, never mind. So, Sorry. So sometimes it takes a few seconds to warm up. Um, <laughs> why, why are we cursed here? Uh, try it. Okay. Uh, was so I supposed my, to my that? experience is that chronological is the best order, and very often when somebody died or, or a new event happened and I go into an article, I find that it's a mess and it has to be rewritten. The facts that are already there need to be rearranged uh, and, and explained for, for the article to be uh, understandable and to, to really teach somebody what this person was, to have it in chronological order so that they weren't suddenly the Nobel Prize winner, and then they went to university, and then uh, the Nobel Prize. Okay. Yeah, and that's, I, I guess, a manual task. Yeah, I mean, we, there is an ongoing work on ordering of events in text, but um, and I guess inserting something in the right spot would be a subset of that task. Well, but it's, it's not very good, though. <laughs> it's more complicated. Than, for example, many Wikipedia articles start with a biography, you know, where he went to school and 
you know, where he got married, when he immigrated to England or whatever, and then they have a separate career section which may be overlapping chronological orientation. And right. a lot of your obituaries may not give the the year. I mean, they said he, he hosted the, the such and such show, but didn't say what year. So your computer may have to do further research to... Right, look throughout the news elsewhere historically and then that sort of thing, yeah. Right. It's, it's another question. The man in the back, though, pretend you have the microphone. Okay, no problem. Uh, I wanted to come to, to make four comments. I'll do them quite quickly and see. I hope they can help you. Um, first of all, you, you show that you can put in snippets from the original article, but that seems to, to be a little problematic because of uh, copyright. So if you're putting uh, big chunks of it, it will at least appear that uh, uh, the, the article now uh, has chunks from another source and <coughs> a robot which is checking copyright will detect this. So it's, it's usually looking at three or four word strings and searching them on the internet, something like this. Um, uh, a second thing you said about uh, using templates, uh, I was thinking maybe that you could use a third way which would actually kind of cure the first problem of copyright. If you could take a sentence and parse it then transform it into a passive tone, which is actually what we usually have in Wikipedia. Make it more like a fact, make it uh, less emotional, less opinionated, to toss those uh, adverbs out, then uh, this kind of processing would, would make it better and would make it unique, which is more like how people actually edit Wikipedia, right? That's how we usually do it. Uh, Another thing which is important about redundancy, uh, the lead, right, should, should also have the most important facts added to it. So you shouldn't just add it into the bo body, but if you figure out something is appearing in many sources, that should probably go also uh, in the lead. That, that's actually something useful. And and so a small, small level of uh, <coughs> redundancy is actually okay for humans. Mm. And the last thing, which is, a bit, I think, a bit complicated, is what we call uh, DUE, Wikipedia DUE. Uh, basically, if there are lots of uh, sources which you found which are dealing with uh, a few facts or a few aspects of the person, they should get more coverage. But if you find uh, many, sorry, you find something which is only covered in one, then probably you shouldn't extract so much information from there. I think, I don't know, it should dominate the other sources. Okay, can I respond to that? Please. Okay, so yes, uh, the first thing you mentioned about snippets and then ci citing, yeah, I think this is a good point, and uh, I guess it actually wasn't entirely clear, but uh, the update, or the automatic update, or the suggested update would of course include that, that article as the uh, source. Um, responding to the second thing, actually your intuition is quite good because some of the work that I'm looking at does exactly what you said. It, it dependency parse, or it, it extracts a, an, a, a tree tr structure like parsing and attempts to, to prune higher nodes in the tree that correspond to what seems to be extraneous information. That's one of the reasons why we like to use multiple news sources because you can see what the overlap is um, for sentences that are, are similar and also from a parsing point of view. Um, uh, and also, on the note of citations, I think another application for this, if you uh, agree, I, it might be to find things that actually don't have citations that should, because we can find one. And then as far as uh, the, um, the uh, lead paragraph. Oh, yes, the lead paragraph. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point. In, in this case here, in the article, it says that uh, he's a host of the main. So that's obviously the main thing ab about him. Uh, that's you know the most salient part of his career. So yeah, I, I noticed that too, and I, I see what you mean. I, th I think um, maybe we'd have to treat this part se separately. Yeah. But um, thanks. If, if I could direct one question to our first presenter, uh, you, you, you identified certain things as newsworthy and reliable. And, and the thing that I think is very difficult is, for example, we, we just had last week a, a US Supreme Court case where the judge started talking and everyone thought, oh my God, he's going to overturn the health care law. And so uh, CNN and Fox News said, you know, overturning health care law. And they sent it out. And then, of course, by the time he finished his speech, it turned out he did the exact opposite. 
So how do you, and, and when I was young, there was this rumor that uh, Paul McCarthy had died. Do you remember that? <laughs> and so, so if everybody's twittering about Paul is dead, and the Supreme Court has overturned this law, and all this sort of stuff, how do you prevent uh, false positives, either because the news source is unreliable, or because you, you've uh, misassociated the, the two Paul McCarthy's, let's say, and one has died and the other one hasn't, how do you, how do you identify the correct Wikipedia article for, for the, the news insertion? You didn't really cover that. That's actually a good question. It's pretty important, uh, and this happens very, very frequently on Twitter, that you have some hoaxes or fakeness. Or just mistakes. Or just mistakes, yeah, yeah, but for any reason, but this shouldn't be a news, or it's not actually a news that it's, or something that didn't actually happen. Yeah, well, so far we have been, this has, uh, research has been conducted with humans. Uh, humans have, have been evaluating whether or not those training topics were true or not. Uh, I have to say that so far we have been analyzing what are the features that make newsworthy or not, but we haven't take a look, a deeper look into veracity or verification of the uh, news. I think it's re this is really difficult when you are working in real time, when you are working on something, trying to process information fast. So actually, many times on Twitter, there are people asking whether or not that's truth, and nobody knows if it's true. You have to wait. Even journalists are waiting if this is true. So I think we have to be careful with this and see if we can really do it in real time, or we have to sometimes see if this is verified or not, and wait to set for some news sources to be available and to come on Twitter. I mean, if there are no news articles linked on those tweets, this means that it hasn't been verified yet. This is something that users are sharing with their, has, hasn't been written on news media. <coughs> and once you have a certain number of, number of articles on newspapers, then probably you can, I think this can be some solution, but we didn't do anything so far. But, but you're 78% Accuracy. Yeah. How how did you measure that? You had obviously had a human make the judgment. Yeah. But but how how did he how deep did he go? Did he really figure out whether it was true news or whether just that whether the computer met the criteria? This seventy nine percent is actually comparing to real news. Real news, because we asked these humans to provide some news sources, links to news media covering this news. So they had to show that. If they said this is newsworthy, you have to show there is a news that covers it, so it's true. But we didn't analyze whether or not those false positives we are finding in our system are due to some fake news or hoaxes or are simply memes or any other kinds of irrelevant contents. I think we have to look into this, and this is really a, an important issue, verification of contents and news and see whether or not it's truth. A big issue, but I think I think it's something really interesting that we have to take a look into it. Or can I comment on something? Just uh, by the way, yeah, we we didn't really have so strict a criteria of which news sources, because as we, tr if you try to limit them, a lot of the trending topics are from um, sources uh, from outside of the United States, and I'm and we were not really familiar with the news sources. And as somebody mentioned in a previous talk, like. It's hard for us to know as people who don't speak, you know, Brazilian Portuguese, for example, I know, like, if it's a valid news source. So, yeah, we haven't really done that. So, uh, look at an, at an article. Can we split that up into fact bits? Like, if I wanted to rewrite this as bullet points. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, yes and no. Uh, with with things that are, we're trying this so far. Oh. I guess I, uh, uh, on very, very specific uh, types of facts. Like, so for something like employment, the system uh, that we have now, there's the slot filling, so it can, can do a, a, a pretty decent job to determine that somebody was employed by some company or that somebody has a certain title. I mean, these are, are learned from, from data that's labeled by humans where they'll highlight the part of the, uh, you know, from uh, this word to this word, this indicates this fact. And uh, these, de determining these types of relations uh, is done with a decent accuracy. 
but uh, sort of things that we didn't anticipate, types of facts that are sort of very unique to the, some situation, it's really, it's almost, in, it's very, very, very low. So the. If I could go through uh, a Wikipedia database term and see that this paragraph here is a fact, something, somebody was employed, but there's no date, so you would have a date missing? Oh, right, yeah, actually. This is feasible, yeah. What our current, what we currently have um, is not quite tailored to that exact task, but, but, but yeah, I think that that is feasible. Yes, sir. Uh, could you uh, speak a little bit about the, the basic technical aspects of the project and says whether uh, this is a media with the extension or whether it's a, it's a standalone uh, project and, uh, and then how you determine uh, what the new sources are, not, not in the sense whether it's this new source or that new source, but whether it's it's just a, a, a general search, or whether you know you specify specific sources, say through URLs or. Okay, well, so right. Okay, so for the part, uh, it's it's as of now standalone, and we're not really doing any of it in real time at this point, just to get the infrastructure. Um, it's you know I'm using older articles, older news, and uh, it's a standalone uh, system. But as far as how we, I, I think your second question was more for arcades. It was, was it, Wait, how yeah, do you I mean, get the actual news article? Well, with, with the first bit, then, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested how you would be looking at, you know, uh, injecting data into, into say, the, the, uh, the media with the installation that is, that is uh, there for work for, for Wikipedia. Well, they, they have APIs for that. Oh, yes, yes, that's what I mean. That's right, what I'm yeah. I mean, if, yeah, I, I haven't uh, quite, set up the, the output uh, as far as exactly how it's formatted. Um, but I imagine that the output that we have or, or that we're working on now is very generic. It, it could be adapted to such an output. But I'm sure that's not trivial. But uh, I, I haven't really looked into it so yet, so actually. It's, so it's more as a proof of concept. It, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. and, and you were you were saying about the other part. Yeah, so are you, you're asking how exactly uh, yeah, we yeah. get the news articles? Yeah, so how? Well, for the news articles, yes, we get and we have a large list of newspapers, domains, corresponding to newspapers. So from those trending topics, uh, we can extract some of the links that are linked from, from those tweets and that belong to these domains. So, yeah, that's it. So from those links, we can provide to the second system and is, is able to did I answer your question? Well, yes, because uh, I mean, it seems to me you have uh, two separate projects almost going on that overlap somehow. Is that is that correct? Actually, yeah. So another thing that that we're working on, and in somewhat independently, but is relevant, is to do entity linking from Twitter messages. So I don't know if I drew all of the right ar ar arrows, but uh, but yeah, tweets also go to entity linking, and so the reason for that is. Uh, we're, we're also planning to extend this to not just people pages, but things about concepts too, whether or not they should be edited or just uh, used for helping to see uh, what should be edited. Uh, the link structure of what's in the tweet and what's in the article, maybe to some extent mirrors uh, a local uh, piece of Wikipedia and that sort of thing. So in that sense, they're a little bit more connected, but you're right though. They're, they either could operate as a standalone thing. That's, that's the thing that there there yeah. seems to be, to be more conceptual complexity than I personally say would be comfortable with in, in one individual project. But if it's more than one project, then, it then is, you're looking yeah. at you know, what's, what's complementary between the projects. It's the same project from an engineering perspective. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions for our first presenters? Uh, otherwise, why don't we have the second presenter come up and then we can have more questions at the end. Uh, sir, if you want to come up and and maybe we'll battle, and, and I will try to steal a microphone with, with a, a better battery. So we'll, by the time the talk is over, we'll, we'll have uh, microphones dancing in the aisles. Okay, so okay. let's give our first presenter a round of Thanks. Applause. Should I get started? Okay, so, um, let me do, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Oren Bochman. I'm uh, from Israel, but uh, I come here by way of uh, Hungary uh, due to a, a very generous uh, support of the Hungarian chapter. 
also, what I usually do is uh, I'm a Wikimedia Wiki developer and I specialize in the search engine. And a lot of uh, my philosophy is based on this particular point of view as uh, somebody who is uh, writing the search engine. And uh, a lot of uh, stuff happens inside of there which I believe would be of greater benefit if we could expose it and uh, use it uh, outside. And this is basically what this talk is about. So let me get started. Um, recently, uh, working, with the working with the Hungarian chapter, we would wanted to make um, uh, a small glam project and uh, sh basically make a, a show of uh, picture of the day. We went to some uh, galleries and showed them the best of our pictures. And unfortunately, they, they turned us down. They told <laughs> us, uh, these are great, great pictures. They're good for many things, but we, we don't want them in our gallery because nobody is going to come and uh, want to see them. They're not artistic. Put them in your encyclopedia, but don't put them in our gallery, please. So that was a bit shocking. <laughs> Uh, we tried to go on and to, to show them other kind of pictures <coughs> from uh, comments, and this is still under nego negotiations. But this is kind of uh, something uh, that motivates this kind of thing. Now, I think we're having a similar phenomenon at article for deletion sometimes. So uh, there's, there's a lot of leeway for deletion of articles. Um, the way this this uh, part of Wikipedia works is uh, some people know the code words, uh, all these COI, these uh, alphabet soup, and new new users really can't get the, uh, a say even if they actually have a, a good claim. And another problem there is um, recent, so the policy isn't even applied in a consistent manner. Uh, recentism something which should actually keep some material out. For example, uh, we had in our previous talk uh, people drawing material in real time, which is, which is wonderful. Um, but some Wikipedia policies <coughs> don't particularly support this uh, in all cases. Um, I'm sure th that uh, these smart people will figure out which ones should be going in and which one maybe should be left out. Uh, but even humans are not very good at doing this, so this is uh, a bit of a difficulty. Um, what about feature content? Well, feature content also suffers from something similar. Uh, it's really, really hard to certify many articles um, to be featured. You have to get somebody who is interested, somebody who is an expert at uh, uh, the manual of style, who knows how to, to do these things, who know the process, and even once you've done it, <coughs> you could pretty much lose it within uh, a few weeks if uh, <laughs> you get some new contributors coming along and actually contributing some good new material but uh, violating some of uh, the sacred policies of uh, featured articles. And actually it could be even worse because I've described the intrinsic case of uh, uh, adding low quality content. It could be a change in the manual of style like uh, Maybe somebody invents uh, inline citations, and then you have to invalidate all your featured article within uh, a certain amount of time. Uh, again, we, we had uh, a great solution from uh, the speakers before me. They come up with a technology which allows uh, putting in these kind of citations, which is one, I think, uh, personally, one of the most difficult parts of uh, research, especially once you've uh, written the article. So I really like to see that happening. Um, <coughs> but pro probably the, the worst problem about this aspect of things is that uh, the violations are not really listed anywhere. They're supposed to go on the talk page according to the templates, but there's nothing there, usually. It's usually because the changes are of the second sort, and somebody, uh, I don't know, does a, a robot does this, or something uh, happening off page. So. 
Another problem with featured articles, which has uh, been highlighted recently by a number of uh, pre presentations, and I think also on the signpost, is that uh, many many uh, people who push forward to featured article have been actually writing on something which is, uh, I would say, uh, very non-specific subject. I, I call it a general uh, subject rather than an important subject. Um, what's an important subject? Maybe something like philosophy. Uh, that's today at uh, sea level. After all these years, we've we've reached uh, sea level quality. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, a large number of uh, featured articles on battleships, on uh, exotic species of rats, and, and all all sorts of things. Which, well, if you take about a hundred of these you don't get as many hits as from that uh, one particular article on, on uh, Alzheimer's. So there is kind of uh, a trade-off. <coughs> you might actually be writing a really high quality uh, article on, on a certain subject, but nobody's gonna read it. So what's really important from our point of view, from uh, uh, people who are serving out the information, trying to get uh, the most relevant stuff to people, is that uh, we give them both. So we, c we come up with something like this. Uh, yeah, we'd like to, to look at importance and quality and somehow combine these and give a smarter kind of uh, decision. Uh, let's see wh what, what kind of stuff we have. Well, if you've got uh, a general subject and it's low quality, like I think, uh, how did Jimmy Wells talk about? He's somebody's uh, grandfather. Uh, so that's what we call good faith spam, and people usually delete it and are not very nice about it. Um, if, it's, if it's high quality and uh, on a very non-specific subject, that just, well, I call it boring, but uh, it may be just not, not very uh, useful. Uh, having, having the stuff always low quality on a very important subject and we have a long list, a backlog of uh, subjects which haven't been covered or are, are still at the starter and stub, uh, which, which appear in all the other top encyclopedias, that's also uh, a major problem. And well, <laughs> uh, don't need to say much about this. And of course, th the best thing is to have uh, the important things, the more important things getting uh, more attention. and. Uh, one, one of the reasons to do, well, one of the ways to do this is basically to measure where we're standing um, and maybe to do this automatically. Now, I, I'd like to switch a little bit over because I've also done uh, a bunch of work uh, with uh, adoptions of new users and I'll kind of tie this a bit further down the line. Uh, let's look at uh, some risks which, which we have with uh, new user engagement. So. Um, new, new users usually come uh, to the wiki, they, the first thing they do is create a new article, but it turns out that this is high risk activity. Probably what you're going to do is uh, get into trouble and well, what you should be doing is maybe trying to get some help, but uh, to know how to get help you actually have to be pretty experienced and socialized, you actually <coughs> have to know how wiki works. This continues even if you get uh, a bit more experience. So uh, beginners, we, we, we can teach them a little bit, we, we give them uh, some lessons, some tips, and then we send them to delete articles. That's a favorite one for anybody who wants to become an admin a bit later down the line. Turns out that uh, you can mess up there pretty, pretty badly too. So uh, what, what, would, what would be better at such a stage, giving people uh, maybe more complex tasks like disambiguating links, but again, this is something that people don't really know about so much, this kind of task. You have to uh, be inside our culture more to, to end up doing these kind of things. And, and, and we can go on and on. So even for intermediate users, we ask people go and uh, revert things, fight vandalism, it's very important. We need a lot of helpers. Um, but a lot of time, all they end up is uh, deleting edits which are one minute old or um, just fighting similar activity to what they were doing a month ago or two months ago. Uh, what we should, again, be doing is asking them, 
um, to focus on their particular area of expertise, maybe translate a section from the language they know, but we don't really know how to ask people to do this. And even at the top level, people who really know the works, uh, if we ask them to coach new users, it turns out this is pretty risky activity too. Um, and maybe should be reserved to, to the most experienced users or maybe just change the way we're doing it. So um, let's look a little bit at the, the risks of the actual people in adoption. It looks like uh, in the old days, way before I was uh, working the uh, Wikipedia, um, adoption and mentoring were very common and were pretty much uh, a fact of life because Wikipedia was small, you couldn't help uh, and bump into much more experienced users <coughs> and within minutes of editing an article, uh, somebody would come along and help you. Instead of delete it, people would uh, comment and tell you, you've done this wrong, let's work together and fix it. And uh, this turned out to be kind of an ongoing uh, relationship between people and there weren't so much policy, people could be taught a lot faster also. So um, that kind of uh, changed. If we're looking today at uh, people who join adoption, 60% of these users within a, a couple of, uh, I would say a couple of uh, months, maybe even less, uh, end up uh, with a retired notice or simply uh, vanish. And uh, the people who go into this are, are not uh, our average users, somebody who's just created a single page. Um, also, if we look at the mentors, well, I took, uh, I tried to, to get some help from uh, people because I also haven't done a lot of edits and I really, really needed help because I was writing a conflict of uh, interest article about my mother. And uh, somebody decided that he's gonna help me. It was wonderful and uh, we collaborated on this and uh, he helped me with <coughs> many issues which it turned out that he knew a lot better than me how to copy edit and uh, how the process works and uh, then, after another couple of weeks, he retired. Okay, I thought, well, th that happens. Uh, I found another chap to help me, uh, a user called Be Musician, and he put me through a whole course with lessons that he'd uh, prepared, and uh, we worked through those, and I graduated with honors. I was very happy. Uh, then I got into trouble, and he kind of helped me out. So not everything was so wonderful, but uh, what <laughs> turned out was that uh, he's retired now as well. So uh, I'm still here, I'm still standing, but uh, it looks like uh, he must have had some more difficulties with the other people he was helping, because usually these uh, mentors are helping a bunch of people. Um, we won't look so much into that, but uh, this is, this is uh, food for thought. So uh, what, what, what are the students like? If you look at uh, the page on adopt a user, you can uh, go to the category, category on the subject, you'll see that about a thousand people have uh, applied uh, on that page, or at least according to the category, uh, and about a hundred have graduated so far. Uh, if we look at the actual people, if we, we go, because the, the records of their adoption program are or online, you can see that these are serious, very serious people. Uh, very high potential, but um, because they're active and uh, maybe even active on controversial areas or because <coughs> we're sending them on suicide missions sometimes, uh, they're prone for uh, conflict and uh, getting to trouble. And uh, what about the coaches? Well, the coaches, I've seen something like uh, 100 active users which are uh, offering these services uh, and 40 more which have retired. So about, uh, I would say, something like a third. Uh, the level of these people, well, some of these are not admins, they're intermediate users with uh, a lot of edits, and it goes all the way up to the top. Some of the board members are also uh, participating in this program. <coughs> and wha what I could say about these particular people is that they're very good communicators, which is kind of uh, a rare commodity these days. Now, let's go back a little bit to uh, the technology side. Uh, how could we use a, a machine to advise us on quality matters? And uh, how can we use this to make Wikipedia more predictable to, to people who are just coming off the street or starting out and uh, want to, to have a, a more sane uh, working uh, conditions? So 
the way I see it, we, we look at the existing policies, we try to figure out what the norms are, and we do this, we basically look at the history, extract some material, and, and use that to train uh, a computer model, uh, and evaluate all sorts of things based on uh, the existing norms. Now, this might work or might not work. What does it depend on? It, it's going to be effective if uh, the norms are not arbitrary. So it's ineffective if uh, what's happening is uh, random. So uh, that's one thing to look at. Uh, and you also need a lot of data on some of uh, new policy or all sorts of phenomena. It's hard to collect a lot of material. For example, there are not very many featured articles around. There are a few thousand, but we got uh, only about, I think, 80% of the articles even rated at all or something like that. So uh, le let's, let's actually look at the, the te uh, more technical aspects of this. Uh, uh, there's been a, a popular book on the subject called uh, Super Crunches, and, and what they basically are uh, reporting is that for all sorts of expert tasks, we can train the machines to actually outperform human experts when, when these actual expert exists. Uh, so let us ask what Wikipedians are, are expert on. So we have a lot of expertise going around. Uh, I think we could safely say that uh, administ administrators have to deal a lot with policy and yeah. they know how to apply it and uh, <coughs> what are the norms when uh, things can be banned and uh, when you cannot, uh, uh, I don't know, violate these. Uh, we have domain knowledge uh, experts, people who actually really, really know about stuff that nobody else here knows. Um, but we, we, we're not very diverse, so we don't have a lot of these people. So we need to get more of these people uh, into the process. And we have the Guild of uh, Copy Editors. It turns out that when we're talking about quality, these turn out to be the most uh, scarce resource. So these are people who are very, very good with English. Uh, and of course we have, well, we need librarians to do research, although again, uh, it would be ideal if we'd have also automatic uh, components that are able to, to do this in a smart way. And translators, because uh, Wikipedia, we have something like 400 languages, and we shouldn't have to reinvent the ball every time. So the big question is, when can machine repla replace uh, man? When can, can they help them? When, which is stronger, in which case? Uh, well, people are subjective, which is good because uh, it makes for more interesting articles. Uh, and machines are objective, which is kind of good if you let them intervene or at least advise us on matters of uh, policy. Um, people have a lot of opinions about things. They, they have high stakes in, uh, when it comes to writing articles. And machines don't particularly care about these kind of things. They just care about what you tell them to decide upon, what, what you've trained mm -hmm. them on. Uh, another problem with uh, human experts, and this is something we see the world around, is that experts overestimate special cases. They see doctors see a lot of uh, possible special cases. They send people to do uh, lots of tests. Um, machines are kind of, uh, <laughs> well, they, they only see 2 or 3% where humans might see 20% of uh, exceptions to all sorts of rules. And in that case, if they try to make a decision, they probably make a mistake. But we can also mm -hmm. tell them not to make a decision when, it, when they detect these kind of uh, outliers. Now, uh, I'd like to actually go and look more, more in detail, even more in detail, about uh, how we can actually use uh, this search engine technology um, to to do things which we, we know in the real world as uh, policy. Um, I'll skip this little bit. And this is, this is what statistical corpus linguistics looks like. We have uh, some expert here who've shown us even uh, more sophisticated uh, workflows. But, but for us, really, this can be a black box. The only thing that's, uh, uh, I think, essential here is that we get uh, a good collection of uh, word triplets. So words, three, we take three words ordered and basically count them. And using just something like this, Google built their translation service. Uh, I don't like it very much, but uh, a lot of power. Well, I don't like it because it's not so successful as it could be. 
but we use it a lot, I think. Um, and it's only getting better as the, the data comes in. And once we have this kind of information, it, ena it enables us to do a lot, uh, a lot more with this kind of technology. Uh, I'll give you one example. I've seen many times on uh, New Page Patrol that we, we get some wonderful new contribution in, well, not Chinese, but who can say what it is? It might be Latin, it might be uh, Cyrillic, it might be God knows what. You can try and put it into Google, but Google only supports uh, a few uh, tens of languages. We support about 400 languages these days. And uh, again, if we take this kind of uh, uh, simple, lo simple model where we take these uh, three words, the language of uh, which we extract them from a particular wiki, and a probability which is just like I said based on their frequency the count we can basically look at four words the first four words in the sentence and figure out what that article is written in and if we have several languages in the in the article we could do uh, we could split it up according to that and once once we we are smarter about this we can actually go and try to do something which uh, I think is kind of missing from our editors today uh, add some kind of a spelling and, and a grammar check and, and people mm -hmm. have created very sophisticated tools to do this but I think the, the people who should be doing it are the ones who are writing. They, they can do a much more effective job but we're not really helping in this area. Uh, we're, we're telling people go figure this out by yourself. Now um, I'll reveal kind of my philosophy here. Uh, I don't think, I don't like the way uh, Wiki beat, we, uh, our notability policy works. I've kind of uh, talked with people who have been around a long time and they said, oh, this is uh, uh, an evil meme, something that was not what it is, uh, wasn't supposed to become so important and so central. We really invented this so we could have uh, reliable information, but uh, now it's kind of become uh, a reason to have fights about uh, inclusion, exclusion, and um, this is what what I consider an, uh, a problematic policy. And the way I define this is uh, uh, a concept I call self-selection. Self-selection means that uh, uh, a policy would uh, tell you intrinsically if something should be included or excluded. And well, that activity or that uh, component would be kind of text. If it's, if it's worth something, if you can show that it has real value, if it can demonstrate this, it should be uh, given a high score. If it doesn't, maybe we should uh, uh, put it in the back of the queue and uh, wait until somebody improves it, maybe in a draft space, uh, or maybe just rank it down on our search engine. Um, so I don't believe that uh, this is a reason to delete something, but, uh, and this is the second point here, because uh, we can actually look at uh, articles, many articles which uh, are not notable, and see that they have uh, valuable information. Um, and maybe tomorrow this is going to be something good, or maybe yesterday people thought this is something which should be in encyclopedia, and uh, if it's just today or yesterday that's changed, uh, it's kind of, uh, we're, we're really going to be losing something. Um, and let's, let's see what else we could do. I mean, uh, I'm suggesting an alternative based on uh, a different kind of analysis. And it's quite simple, I think. Um, <coughs> this is a bit, f OK, so basically we look again at uh, the word frequency. And uh, we check what we have inside an article. We have s stuff which we call stop words, which uh, use people used to throw them away. We have the, the core vocabulary, which is like the first thousand words you have to learn uh, when you master a new language. The, the most important ones are concrete words about <coughs> things you can actually hold. Uh, more complicated are the abstract ones. Um, then we have the words we learn in school, high school, these are the extended set, and uh, technical language, which is actually uh, the more interesting things uh, in an encyclopedia. And then we actually have a bunch of other things, so uh, 
This actually comes from the Bible, the study of the Bible. We have the Hapax Legum, <laughs> Legoman, which are words which only appear once in our corpus. So all sorts of words which uh, appear only once in the Bible and go figure out what they actually mean after 2,000 years. Uh, so people do that. Uh, luckily, we don't have such a big problem with uh, figuring out what they mean, but they're very much indicators of uh, information of, uh, well, I say something, maybe not notability, but of value. Um, so if we look at both ends of the spectrum, the stop words, well, they're the most common. They, they don't really mean very much to us, uh, but, uh, um, but they are useful at uh, measuring style, at uh, looking at uh, how much emotion <laughs> is expressed in a text, mm -hmm. while on the other end we see uh, these rare words, which are generally just uh, simple uh, proper nouns, and these indicate uh, quality. Uh, once, once we, look, we kind of uh, look at an article and uh, break it down according mm -hmm. to the rare ones, uh, if, it, if we know that uh, the article contains these kind of rare words, uh, this is an indicator of quality. So the first indicator of something uh, unique. Let's, let's give an example. So here are kind of two stops which I've uh, invented, but they're based on uh, uh, articles which I've met recently. Uh, casinos in Idaho, we have actually articles on all the states. Uh, so let's look just at the links. Which one do you, would you think is uh, more uh, important, which has intrinsic value? Let's, let's see about uh, people who think support A, maybe put your hands up. OK. Uh, B, OK, that's great. So basically, these kind of articles actually don't follow the policy, the first one anyway. Uh, we're told don't make a uh, link to something like the USA. It doesn't really lead to anything which somebody is interested in this casino it wants to, to see ever. They already know where that is, okay? Maybe they, they need uh, something else. But on the other hand, um, the second article, we're actually going somewhere and we're looking at technical terms. Uh, maybe not unique, but one step before uh, the, the, the most rare. Um, so if we recap, all we've done is we've collected uh, the words from Wikipedia, uh, uh, ranked them globally, we've given them kind of a weight depending on their uh, rarity, and using this to evaluate the, the information inside the article. And uh, the more articles we have, the better actually we can do this. Uh, so this is kind of an argument against deleting articles, uh, inclusionist philosophy. Uh, let's look at another little application. So um, I was complaining before that maybe uh, if we ex extract uh, materials from other articles, we're going to get into big trouble here. And this is something a lot of new users end up doing. Um, they basically copy bits and pieces from outside of Wikipedia, maybe whole articles, and start to work on them inside Wikipedia. Uh, we have a possibility to actually do something different using technology today, and this is a, a technique which is used for evaluating essays. So uh, it was invented by some university professors who wanted to assign essays to students and they didn't really want to go and uh, mark hundreds of essays, so they put it on. They put this kind uh, of program online, and they said, "Okay, I'll just write the perfect essay." Actually, that was too much work as well. So they said, "Okay, I'll just put a copy of the relevant chapters in the textbook and uh, compare it to what the students have written." And uh, we can do that too. So basically. Suppose we, we just take a template and uh, uh, select our sources, put them in. OK, this, this is what should be in the article. Uh, that's what it looks like today. Uh, we, we could, uh, based on these, uh, manually expand it. But it's kind of hard to see where, you s where, where you're standing today uh, with the article. But uh, we could actually give you a number which is saying, what a percentage, how well are we covering all the 
important terms, the, the, the really unique information inside the, uh, this article. So uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, as we try to progress and improve the article quality, we're not actually go going to uh, be stuck just looking at the manual of style and how well the citations are written, which is most problems with the final steps of uh, getting featured status, we'll actually be looking at uh, how well we can check facts. And that's something which is actually less technical, but also quite difficult. But this can point you in the right direction. Um, let's look at another uh, little application. This is something which always annoyed me. Uh, we have a lot of problem with this ambiguation. So I, I said this is kind of a safe activity, but it's kind of difficult to do well. Well, it turns out we have ambiguity at all levels of language. Uh, Wikipedia we goes to great lengths to, to fix this, and we do all this work manually. It turns out that uh, using a few technologies, simple ones, um, we could pretty much figure most of these out. So I, I've given you a couple of examples here. This is a famous sentence, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. And if we simply attach to the end of uh, the problematic words, they're part of speech. So is it a verb? Is it a noun? Oh, they look quite different now. OK, and the, ambi this, the ambiguity is gone. And we, we can, uh, if we look at the research, uh, it turns out that the parts of speech used in Wikipedia are far in excess of what usually the dictionary lists. Um, and and uh, again, a machine can do a pretty good job at actually just sticking this stuff onto mm -hmm. the end of the words, figuring out um, the the meaning of the words. Now, a, a second level of doing this is sometimes well, this isn't enough. Uh, sometimes you have a, a homonym, a word which has two different meanings. Well, we have uh, other algorithms, some other tricks. Uh, I'm kind of running out of time, so. Uh, I can't get into all of these, so I'd like to uh, kind of connect all of these uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, two other subjects. So one of these is uh, how we can look at uh, stylometric information. So one of, th one of the interesting problems we have in Wikipedia, kind of a unique problem, is sock puppets. It turns out that uh, some years ago, people were looking at uh, the Federalist Papers or the, the works of Shakespeare, and th there were big fights about who wrote what, was it really the same guy, or wasn't it? Well, we're having the same problem every day, uh, some of us. And it turns out that, again, the research community is really interested in this and uh, provides all sorts of solutions. Uh, basically, all, all, all there, okay, there are, there are a bunch of ways to do this. Uh, tens of algorithms to do it, but uh, some of them are pretty robust. You can basically look again at the stop words, which we were looking at the mm -hmm. beginning, the most common words, and look at their patterns. Look at uh, the pronouns, and that that allows you to to fingerprint uh, users. This isn't so easy to use on a regular page, but on a top page, it works like a charm. Uh, you obviously realize that on, on a regular page, there might be many editors, so this gets mixed up. Another technique which, well, we already use with check users is to look at metadata. And these two things can be combined. We can do these together without actually looking at somebody's uh, IP mm -hmm. and get a pretty good picture if it's the same guy, if it's a bunch of guys doing it and maybe take some action without violating their privacy, um, which, which is kind of uh, useful if maybe they're going to be in trouble with their government uh, for trying to, to make a political statement and they're, they're having uh, some kind of a fight. So uh, I'd like to, uh, a couple of words about how we put this together, how we, we use all of this to help new users. Well. Uh, we have the manual of style and uh, uh, auto wiki browser. We use auto uh, tools like auto wiki browser to uh, correct things, or, or we do it uh, manually. Um, we we could uh, instead um, program a, uh, a kind of a robot which takes all of these uh, matrix, 
puts them together, figures out, first of all, what, what are the uh, most important editing tasks remaining uh, in a particular article that's interesting for me. So uh, it would actually tell me, okay, uh, on this article, Wikify, you, you're missing the links. That's a, a safe activity. And uh, it could even point me the way to do it. Um, on another one, it could tell us uh, add, add more uh, reliable sources and so on, just by looking at uh, all these criteria we, which we looked at before. Um, we, on the other hand, uh, I ha the, okay, so I did mention, but I am collaborating with uh, another person on this, Stefan Laporte from the Wikimedia Foundation, mm -hmm. and he takes a kind of uh, opposite approach to me. He looks at uh, uh, something like 50 or 60 metadata um, aspects of the article. So it's, it's readability level, uh, it's editing patterns, how many editors have been working on it, how, many, uh, how much conflict has been going on while developing it, how many reverts, how stable is it over time. And we kind of combine these things and, and uh, generate a lot of intelligence about the article and using this we build uh, basically a queue of uh, tasks which uh, should be used to improve it and uh, to these we, we basically can generate a bunch of uh, advices what uh, a mentor would tell you to do and uh, offer these offer somebody three choices why don't you try a b c and if that goes well we watch that particular adoptive person and uh, let this, let this uh, proceed on and on and on as, as long as they're willing to participate in this kind of adoption. Okay, um, I think I kind of covered my material. Are there any questions, perhaps? Um, with regard to the um, coverage metric that you talked about where you can evaluate whether uh, an article has adequate representation of the material in the sources. What studies have you done or are you thinking of doing that would validate the results the tool gives you? So um, there's actually not just, uh, well, I haven't done a, bit, a, a bunch of studies, but uh, these are, um, so I'm basically integrating here. I'm using uh, existing algorithms like latent, uh, uh, Dirichlet indexing or um, latent, uh, sorry, uh, LSA or LSI or a whole bit. So there's a whole family of uh, um, uh, algorithms being used to, to do this. Uh, some of them have been patented. Some of them are used uh, to, to score GMAT and most documented uh, on Wikipedia. And we're basically uh, looking to integrate these. So uh, all we're doing is pulling in the data and calibrating it against uh, uh, what we see in featured articles. You would, you would typically, somebody who isn't familiar with the technology would think that this is an exercise of human judgment that's necessary to determine whether the material should have been included. And it's a comparison against a human assessment that I was wondering about. Have you cross-checked and had Right. So uh, we don't do this that way. We that's kind of uh, the thing to understand about this technology. We're basically working like bean counters. We're we're just counting things. But uh, what what do we do in this case? We're basically looking at the all the semantics on all those particular pages and saying uh, we expect that all the important words, all the unique words should actually appear on the article. Maybe we're wrong, so maybe there are some sections there which are not relevant to the article. Maybe we're going to break the article into two. Uh, then, of course, we would actually have to move some of the sources, or we won't, we'll never have 100% coverage of that. But it's certainly going to show us uh, that we're missing something. And I'm hoping to uh, work with the visualization experts once we do have this, and basically to show you um, what is actually coming maybe from particular source, so kind of maybe get, get those things colored and maybe tell you on a particular section something is missing.
that's kind of the advice I'd like to offer rather than uh, saying you've just done 20%. Sorry, uh, the next. No, no problem. Um, so, uh, so I missed the very first part of your talk. You might have addressed this, but um, do you see this as a, as a replacement for mentorship? Um, because I'm actually curious about even kind of calling this, uh, this process mentorship. It, I, have, I, have some, I have some background um, working with engineers who do uh, machine learning and NLP tasks, so I know a little bit about how the technology might work. But what it sounds like to me you're doing is, um, at least in the, in the new user uh, case, case study, is intelligent task routing, right? So you're not, even in your own description of your mentorship experience, the kinds of things, the kinds of things you get from a mentor are very different, and it's a superset um, kind of of what you might get from interacting with uh, uh, a bot that's uh, suggesting things that need to be done on a page. So I'm curious about why you why you framed it as uh, as a, an alternative to well or maybe not, mentorship rather no, than something a, else? This is a very good question, thanks. Actually, uh, I have, a, I think, uh, an answer for you. So basically, uh, what I've done, so I haven't really uh, done this uh, in the context of this particular talk, but uh, what I originally did was write a proposal for uh, the Wikimedia Foundation to make this kind of automatic system, and this was not funded, so we uh, we still continue to be interested in this, me and some other people which uh, kind of supported this. And we said, let's go ahead and see what we can do just by ourselves uh, as part of the community. And that was the time I actually said, let me go into adoption and, and see what actually is happening there. And uh, I've kind of studied this. And what I, I've personally done is I've developed uh, a new adoption school with something like three or four times as many lessons, which I consider missing or less dangerous, and maybe push those other, other uh, more risky activities further down the line, okay? So this is one thing. Now, I don't see, I really don't believe that a fully automatic uh, coaching solution makes any sense, like you suggest. But I do think that it does, uh, to, do, to be an effective coach requires a lot of uh, drudger drudgery. You have to actually watch what uh, your, uh, men your students are doing and when they're getting into trouble or when they just need help. Um, this we can automate. So this part I'd like to do and then it comes down to basically maybe asking some other humans to step in when you don't have the advice. Do we have time for one? We have time for one more question. One more question from the audience. Anyone? Thank you. Um, so I have a comment about the um, quality assessment. One of the features you mentioned is the importance, but I think it's uh, importance. Uh, I think it's uh, subjective. Isn't it? So, for example, the article about casino may be important for some people, uh, more important than th than the other one. So one. Um, so. Uh, um, can we make it, uh, instead of uh, having features, articles for everyone, uh, can we suggest articles for a specific person? If that person is interested in a certain topics, we can uh, suggest uh, important articles for, for in, in that topic. They can already do that. There are robots. Go ahead and respond. So actually, this, again, is uh, something of this is something I've thought about in a different context. So basically in the context of uh, actually developing the next generation of uh, Wikipedia search engine. So what I wanted to do, uh, this is under debate, is basically to collect uh, each person who agrees the, their historic information about what they actually searched before and use that to give a, a personalized uh, point of view. And um, this can, so we're talking actually about the same technology that we just discussed, but when it runs within the search engine. So yes, uh, it is possible both in coaching and uh, both in evaluating these things to um, skew this according to personal preferences. But I think uh, if, I'm, if I'm looking at replacing something like uh, something major like notability, um, I would like to kind of make it objective, just to make it sane for most people. So I'd rather kind of come up with an answer which reflects reality, well, basically the reality in Wikipedia, rather than anybody's opinion. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not looking to uh, replace something. I just like the, the additional features that um, suggest people 
So people come in and read and they, they want to, to see what uh, articles are related to, the, to their personal records. Yeah, so uh, definitely, if, if I could have somebody's uh, a little bit of information without, and we, we're thinking how to do this without violating uh, people's privacy, so still to, to store a little bit about this, it would be possible to automatically disambiguate things according to your preference rather than uh, uh, general what uh, to, s to suggest search results which are actually more interesting for you. Um, yeah, we're looking to do this, and it, it's certainly possible. Let, let's give uh, all of our presenters a round of applause, please.